Hello and welcome to In the Spotlight, where we host a 15-minute conversation with industry experts leading up to shared conversations within the USBC network. On behalf of our president, Ron Busby, our board, chambers, and staff, thank you all for attending. I'm Lisa Carter, Program Coordinator of the Community Navigator Pilot Program through the U.S. Black Chambers, fondly known as the National Voice of Black Businesses. Today, we welcome Ms. Roxanne Rivera Weist, a published writer and founder of GovBizTech, to the conversation. Ms. Rivera Weiss uh, has been the conduit of much success and scale as she's grown her business from $1,300 um, from a $1,300 investment to a over $20 million um, valuation. As the author of There Is No Crying in Business, How to Succeed in Male-Dominated Businesses by Paul Grave McMillan, and a highly decorated awarded recipient. Um, Ms. Rivera Weiss, welcome to today's conversation. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, we are absolutely honored. We I've had the privilege of working closely um, with Ms. Rivera Weist, um, and we have a number of questions that we just want to know, uh, just really the businesswoman behind the brand, the publishing, um, and we just have some questions today. So without further ado, um, our first question is, what, um, growing up, what influences or entrepreneurs may have been present um, who inspired who you are today? Well, um, I grew up in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and um, I grew up in a time that, you know, there weren't a lot of female role models um, when I was growing up. I looked to my dad as my role model. My dad worked three jobs so that my mom could stay home and take care of us. And I saw in him this wonderful work ethic. And he instilled that in myself and in my brother and my sister at a very, very early age. So um, I think that that is what guided me is the fact that I had a, a good work ethic. I saw a strong, you know, incredible man who worked hard for his family. And that's really what affected me more than anything was the fact that I had this good work ethic. And I also, he also instilled in us, you know, you can do whatever you want. You're the only one that holds yourself back. And so with those two things in mind, that's, that's kind of what guided me moving forward in my life and my career. That's powerful. I absolutely love that. Um, and especially having that influence, a lot of what I've seen is those who grew up in a family where there are dedicated and determined workers like your father, you often have that same ambition um, and it often turns into entrepreneurship. Um, and so with having that ambition and having that vision, how do you find balance in your career and social life? I think that... Um... When I first started out in my career, I, I really didn't have a balance. Uh, I worked very, very hard. And, and I think that as an entrepreneur, you do have to work that hard in the beginning. Um, and so I think that balance came as I got more confident in my career. As I started making more money, I could actually afford to have more balance. And now that I'm older, I, I see the importance of having balance. Um, I think a lot of times uh, when you're just starting out, you just don't really see the importance in that. And it isn't until you sit back and you can reflect. Um, and so I make, I make a concerted effort to, to have that balance and to not get, it's very, very easy. I, I am very passionate about my clients so it's very easy for me to get wrapped up in it on a daily basis. And I have to be able to tell myself, you know what, you have to step back and just breathe. And um, <laughs> so it's a, it's a constant reminding myself to have that balance. Awesome. And then I guess with that, I, our question is what preparation um, maybe helped you to continue to propel and scale your business and 
you know, what um, other influences, whether it was through mentorship, you know, books, affirmations, what other resources helped you with, you know, getting through those maybe tougher situations um, and staying encouraged? Well, I had one of the things that I was very lucky to have is I was lucky to be surrounded by a lot of strong women, um, women who were either starting their own businesses the way I was. Um, I had a, a fabulous female CPA who was, and we're still friends to this day. And, and then just every woman that I seemed to encounter was, you know, and I kind of came, I came into it, I came into running a construction company and owning a construction company in the 80s. And that was still when women were not construction company owners. Um, so I needed to have that group of women surrounding me telling me, you can do this, you know, you can move forward, you can do this, because there was a lot of negativity against women in the construction industry. Uh, which I never understood because the construction industry is very much an industry where you have to multitask. And I think women are great at multitasking. And so I think it's something that is just made for us. And so uh, in my way of thinking, I, I, the only thing that was holding me back was the fact that it was a male dominated field. And so having that group of women to back me up, to be able to bounce things off of, uh, to be able to pick up the phone and call and say, hey, I'm having a bad day. Those things are just so crucial um, when you are starting a business, when, when you're running a business. Um, and, I, and, and I guess that, that's probably it. I think that that, that was my main, my main, the main impactful people were the group of women that I surrounded myself with. And, I, and to follow up with that question, you mentioned, you know, of, of course, the barriers to entry, especially being a female entering the construction business. And then in the 80s, why construction? As a, well, you know, it's very, it's very weird. And, and I ask myself that all the time. <laughs> because my degree is actually in communications. Um, but I happen to be, and now they call it SAM.gov, where you go in to find all different kinds of opportunities. The government sells everything. But back when I was starting my company, there was like this little yellow pamphlet that used to come out every day. And I don't know how I happened to pick up a copy. And I looked at it and I thought, wow, the government buys everything. I mean, they, they buy toilet paper, they buy pencils, they buy construction uh, equipment, they buy construction jobs. And so I thought, you know, this is something that I could probably do because I came out of college with a, a degree in communications thinking I could do anything in the entire world. And so that's a good thing, but it's also a bad thing because sometimes you get into some you know, messes, <laughs> but, but I had some good people. I found a project uh, at White Sands Missile Range and I went to see the contractor that was currently on the project and lo and behold, he turned out to be my third cousin. <laughs> so, because in New Mexico, people, you know, people know, it, and it's probably that way in every state, but you end up being related to a lot of people. And so he took a chance on me and that's how I got my first job. And after that, I figured, because with, the good thing about a communications degree is that you can either talk yourself into something or talk yourself out of something. And I thought, you know, if I can, if I can get the jobs, I can always hire people to do it. And so that was, my motto was, I'll shoot the bear and I'll let somebody else figure out how to skin it. And that kind of became my motto. Uh, in business. Well, awesome. And, and as you stated, with your communications degree, you are doing just that. You're doing everything. You've built, you know, a very successful uh, business and brand. You've been able to publish a book, which, of course, we want to know about, you know, what, um, as you stated, the, the experience getting into construction, I'm sure, inspired it. But maybe some things that uh, 
really kind of motivated you and helped you during the process of publishing, becoming a, a published author. Um, we're ex uh, interested in learning more about that as well. But um, with communications, you're at the face of your business. You're able to communicate on your behalf all, you know, even currently. So that is something that is, I'm sure, is being used today. But in regards to the book, we do want to know, okay, what, um, before publishing this book, what were some things I know you mentioned wanting to pretty much provide a blueprint or, or uh, motivation for other women who may have been interested in um, intercepting the construction industry? What are some other motivators that inspired you to write your book um, and publish this book? Um, and Tell us a little bit more about some of the opportunities that uh, resulted from that uh, that uh, experience. Well, I, I sold my company. I was in business for 26 years and then I sold my company. And because it was the opportune time, it was right before the 2009 downturn. So it, it ended up being a real opportune time for me to get out of it. And, and quite frankly, I was burnt out. Construction is a tough, is a tough industry. But after I got out of it, I thought, you know, I want to be able to impart what I've learned by being in a male dominated businesses to other women so that they don't feel um, intimidated because it to this day, it can still be intimidating for a woman to get involved in a male dominated business. So I thought, well, I'll just talk about my experiences. Um, how did I handle situations? And, and so I wrote the book um, and I was in a, um, an organization, a professional organization called the National Speakers Association. And I, while I was writing the book, I went to a convention and there was a lady who was speaking, who was a, um, she was an agent. And so I liked her and I was so stupid, I thought, I'm gonna see if she'll if she'll represent me to publish my book. <laughs> so I walked up to her and I said, "You know what? I want to hire you to help me get my book published." And she said, "Honey, you don't hire me. I hire you." <laughs> and I was like, "Oh my god!" And she said, "No, I have to decide if you're good enough for me to want to help work with you and publish your book because I have a reputation to uphold." And I kind of, you know, I, I wouldn't let it go. I'd call her. She lived in Pittsburgh. I even took a plane and flew out to Pittsburgh and took her to breakfast. And finally, she acquiesced and said, okay, okay, I'll, I'll help you. And so it was her that took me to Palgrave Macmillan, and we were able to get the book published. That's awesome. That, yeah. What do we say in networking, which we'll talk a little bit more about um, in our upcoming session, uh, making your offer count, but building those networks um, really helps to propel your business. Um, and I think we may have time for one more question. Um, so if if you don't mind sharing, uh, maybe what tactics, um, in addition to having conversations like that, did you use to really market your brand, market your certifications um, to really get equitable opportunities? Well, the one thing that I found that I needed to do is, and this, this goes back to where before I started being able to find balance, but I think it's something that is essential for anybody who wants to succeed, who wants to sell themselves. You have to be everywhere. Um, if there's an event going on, be at that event. Um, you know, write an opinion piece for the newspaper on something that's going on. Just always have your name out there. And eventually people will be like, oh, there's Roxanne. I read an article that she wrote in the paper or, oh, I saw you last week at, at you know, so-and-so. That's why when, when COVID hit, I was just, I was devastated for people because I thought, you know, networking is just so, such an essential part of building your brand, of, of being able to attract business. Um, and, and I think it's, you know, it sounds old fashioned, but it's really not because re relationships are what it's all about. You have to build those relationships and you have to um, kind of become an expert 
in your field. You know, just always be ready to give an answer. If, uh, if, if um, I know when I was when I was running my business, people would pick up the phone and they'd say, you know, we want your opinion on this particular thing that's going on in the construction industry. I always had an answer because I always wanted to make sure my name was out there. And eventually people started looking at me and saying, oh, well, let's call Roxanne or, you know, let's consult with Roxanne. And so that it, to me is, is crucial, is, is being places, getting yourself seen, um, getting your name out there, whether it be, and it's so simple to write an opinion piece for your local newspaper um, and, and do it on a consistent basis. And eventually you start, and that's how you attract, you know, um, I know we're gonna talk about capital. Well, if a banker knows who you are and they know your reputation, they know your credibility, that is, that is just going to speak volumes about your ability to obtain credit, your ability to you know, build a huge line of credit with your bank. Um, they will back you up when you're trying to go after a particular contract. So, so that's the advice that I would give for that. Absolutely. Well, we definitely appreciate it. And this session seemed to have flown by. We had a lot of great information. Um, uh, today, Ms. Rivera Weiss, like, thank you so much uh, for taking this time. A tremendous thank you to all of you who uh, will also be attending. We want all of you to register for our upcoming session, um, which will take place on June 21st as part two of our Contracts and Capital series titled Making Your Offer Count. And we'll have industry experts like Ms. Rivera Weiss, who will also be giving us a deeper conversation on ways that you can uh, really leverage those opportunities, making a sound offer, uh, which is comprised of a polished proposal that access to capital and trustworthiness through you know, credit um, opportunities, uh, funding and capital, and then having a solid bid. All of that is produced by those networking opportunities, leveraging those um, mentorships and those resources that are available. So to learn more about some of those options, be sure to register today for that session on June 21st. It'll take place at 1130 Eastern Standard Time. Um, and again, on behalf of USBC, we thank you all um, for sharing with us today. And we will see you again soon. Until next time.